Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship service here at First Baptist Church in Oxford. It's good to see so many folks out here. Well, it's a little bit of a dreary day, but we trust God will warm your hearts with the message that we hear today and the joy and love that we can share. We want to thank those folks who helped with the service for Brenda and all those who provided food. We want to thank them, but also to our church family at home, let you know that our dear sister Joyce has gone on to the internal rest of her loving Lord and Savior. So let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come here, we bow before you, recognizing you, Father, are the author and the finisher of life. Father, we thank you for the things that you have brought to us. Carry us through to that day that you bring call us home. Give us that peace and understanding that only you can give through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we would pray. Amen. Amen. Well, what better place to be than here worshiping together as we come to join in worship of our great God and King in good times and in bad. Here this morning, as we join together, I'd invite you uh, to stand with me. Uh, we're going to begin with a call to worship on this Advent Sunday, the Advent of Peace. <clears throat> For our Advent readings over the next few weeks, we're going to be doing it responsibly. So I invite you to read along with me here. I will start us off. Let's read together. <clears throat> and on that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, so that your joy may be made complete. These things I have spoken to you in figures of speech. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you openly of the Father. On that day, you will ask in my name. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. His disciples said, Behold, now you are speaking openly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to trust you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming, and has already come, for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Would you bow with me? for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you because Christ's coming really truly was the advent of peace. He brought peace into this world and has now brought peace into our hearts and for that we can but rejoice this morning. We thank you for that peace that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Peace with God because of the sacrifice he gave on our behalf. We ask now that you would be glorified in our gathering here this morning, rejoicing in you alone for the work that you've done in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please get out your hymnals now and turn with me to hymn number 131 as we begin our time of singing together with angels from the realms of glory. Oh 
64 as we sing one small chant. <laughs>
Well, as we prepare now for a time of study together, reading the Word of God there in Philippians chapter 2, I invite you to sing along with me hymn number 137. For this, you may remain seated. We'll sing together. What child is this?
kind of pulls all of this together with these two verses, 17 and 18. And this morning as we start off, I'd like to ask you a very simple question. Very simple question. What is the greatest joy of your heart? Now I know it's not Joy Sunday, that's next week, but I think it goes, the question goes much with what we're studying here this morning. What is the deepest joy of your heart? That's to really ask, what is it that makes your heart jump with exclamation when you see it or experience it? Something that gets you to shout with excitement and gladness over anything else. What is that thing? There are certainly a lot of things that we enjoy, a lot of things maybe that we take pleasure in. You know, this time of year, if you haven't figured it out, some, it's a time of year that I really, really enjoy. And one thing that I like about this time of year are the Christmas lights we see up all over the place. Christmas lights. And, and it just kind of makes the streets glow. I often ask Ashley, I say, you know, I think we get it wrong. Because we should really, probably we'd do ourselves some favors if we kept up the Christmas lights through like February or March. And it's so dark and dreary. You want to start a petition? Yes, I can get that going. I'm okay with that. Okay. Especially because, you know how hard it is? If any of you set up Christmas lights, you know how difficult it is to set those things up and they're down in like 30 days. But I like Christmas lights. And, and, and some of my f- favorite Christmas lights since we've come to live here with you guys have been the ones that, have you ever been to see the ones at HERS factory? Yeah. And we were just there the other day and I'm just always amazed going through there. And I guess if I understand correctly, Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think HERS actually did some kind of a contracting with some of the, the, the neighbors in the community where now not only is it the lights at HERS factory, but it's also the ones on the houses right around hers. And so, man, that street, that whole thing, I could just sit there for a while. Problem is, I get run over. <laughs> I love Christmas lights. Now, perhaps the only thing I enjoy more than Christmas lights is a good home-cooked meal, or perhaps, like we're going to enjoy, enjoy later on, a Baptist potluck. Right? A good Baptist potluck. You don't leave hungry. Keep that in your mind. We'll talk about that Baptist potluck a little later on. But what is it that brings you joy? What is it that brings you joy? As you ponder that this morning, one of the interesting things I believe is largely indicative of the human heart is that when we consider things that bring us joy, we often think of it in terms of both and. Right? We don't just pick one thing. We like to have it all. When we find ourselves with a decision between two things to enjoy, we often perhaps maybe find ourselves trying to find a way to get both. Right? You want fries with that shake? Yes, please. And make it a double size. Right? We want both and. We want two things at once. No, I'm not talking about that Travis Kelsey commercial I've got going right now. But we often try to find ways, when we look at two options, to say, well, why can't I just have both? And one of the most agonizing decisions we might face is when we're left with two things we really enjoy. We say, okay, pick one. Pick one. When we're confronted with options we like, we try to find a way to fit both in. But the thing is, such a mindset is really in conflict with the overarching message of Scripture. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, 
or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And then you know he closes that and saying, you cannot serve God and wealth. You can't have two masters. And in a major way, Paul came face to face with this reality when Christ confronted him on the Damascus Road. You remember that. Paul had a confrontation with the Lord and a decision was to be made. Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Saul. It was a moment in Paul's life when he went from serving his own purposes to sacrificing himself before the Lord. It was this moment in his life when it was, there was a decision to be made. There was a crossroads. Who will I serve? Because in fact, as I sit here thinking that I'm serving God, I'm actually persecuting God. So which way will it be? What decision would he make? This really leads us to our passage here this morning as we consider following Christ and the cost that comes with that Holy Spirit-driven decision. In Paul's writing here, in verses 17 and 18, we are given a tangible expression of how he viewed his life. Not just this aspect of his life. No, his entire life. Much like we should be thinking of following Christ now today. This isn't just a mere thing we put in our back pocket. This is a commitment to a life driven to honoring Christ with all that we are and all that we have. And I want you to remember back with me this morning some of the things we said about the Apostle Paul when we were studying in really the first chapter and a little bit of the beginning of chapter 2. You remember in chapter 1, Paul tells us that he had joy despite the fact that there were men who were proclaiming the gospel but out of a selfishness, a selfish motivation really to afflict Paul. We said that they were driven by things that were different than a true profession in Christ. But then he, he goes on to say that he's happy to endure that so long as the gospel is proclaimed. So hey, that's okay, so long as people are hearing about Christ. That's radical. And then he says that this is all underpinned by two words that you're going to be hearing a lot about. I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler alert. You're going to be hearing these more and more and more. It's all underpinned by one purpose. One purpose. Paul suffers for God's glory. And now today we read another refrain that I would argue echoes the same chorus. It's a similar chorus being shared here with us this morning in verses 17 and 18. Paul says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Even if I am to be poured out. This is quite a strange statement, perhaps, in your mind. It's in some ways like a word that you're going to hear mentioned a couple times here this morning. It's a peculiar statement. One that invokes, perhaps, a confusing picture of Paul's ministry. But as we entrench ourselves in what Paul is trying to say here... I believe we might be convicted by the implications for us as a body of believers. 
Let me remind you briefly of the verses leading into this passage. We said that Paul had just talked about ridding ourselves of grumbling and complaining. We're not to argue and dispute about the work that God has called us to do. Much like the Israelites, when God laid circumstances before them, when he instructed Moses and said, go and do such and such a thing, and the people said, I don't know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Right, John? Yeah. What's that grumbling sound like? We were trying to figure that out this morning. Talking about murmuring. <laughs> grumbling under our breaths. And then in verse 17, he points to something quite remarkable. We know that Paul takes great joy in seeing the church thrive in a world that is so clearly set against Christ. One of Paul's greatest joys was seeing Christ's bride thrive. That's what he wanted to see. We know that he had joy in that. And here Paul says that he desires to see the church, which he has partnered with through thick and thin, live boldly in the midst of difficult trials. To stand steadfast as they endure. He wants them to hold fast to the Word of God. You see that in the previous verse there. Persevering in the midst of a spiritual battle. This would be of great satisfaction for Paul and would be a blessing to him as he considers the mighty work that God is doing. Take note here this morning. I think this is a very practical application for us. You know, your church leaders, those who are here to serve, the deacons, myself, certainly I can speak for myself. I take great joy when I see each of you living for the Lord. That gets me excited. Right? I, I think I can share at least a little bit with Paul and, and what he says here. When, when church leaders, when people who have been placed as overseers in the church see the people in the congregation in the body of Christ thriving in the ministry, man, that, that gets me jacked up. I get excited when I see you guys going out of your way to serve Christ. That's a blessing to me, and it certainly was a blessing to Paul. And, and Paul spoke, remember, from prison. And so Paul took great joy in hearing these things when his fellow believers in Philippi were standing firm for the gospel. And in this, Paul now says that as they stand firm, he is willing to endure to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of their faith. Now, this terminology is not one that we should pass over because it's, it's quite deep, perhaps even a little foreign to us based on what we know of our culture today. But for a little bit of background here to help us understand, it's interesting, this isn't the only time that Paul uses this terminology. If you'd like, you can turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. 2 Timothy. Now, if you know a lot about 2 Timothy and what was going on here in Paul's life, he was really winding down. All right? He knew, all right, I'd been through a lot. The end's coming. The end's coming. He knew that his death was likely imminent. And in his letter to Timothy, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. At the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. 
No, he says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And, and here in verse 17 of Philippians chapter 2, he says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering. This, this concept of a drink offering was one that must have held a significant weight in Paul's mind as he uses it multiple times throughout his letters. And as Paul alludes to this concept of a drink offering... He draws from a picture that the Philippians certainly would have understood. This idea, this concept of a drink offering was pretty common in ancient cultures, but also within the culture there of Israel. Interestingly, we see it referenced in Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15 verses 1 through 10. Numbers chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. And if you want to keep along with me here, you can turn there in your Bibles. Numbers chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. It says, Now Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land of your places of habitation, which I am going to give you, then make an offering by fire to Yahweh, a burnt offering or a sacrifice to fulfill a special vow, or as a free will offering, or in your appointed times, to make a soothing aroma to Yahweh from the herd or from the flock. And the one who brings his offering near shall bring near to Yahweh a grain offering of one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one-fourth of a hint of oil. And you shall prepare wine for the drink offering. One-fourth of a hen with the burnt offering or for the sacrifice for each lamb. Or for a ram you shall prepare as a grain offering two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one-third of a hen of oil. And for the drink offering you shall bring near one-third of a hen of wine as a soothing aroma to Yahweh. And when you prepare a bull from the herd as a burnt offering or a sacrifice to fulfill a special vow, or for peace offerings to Yahweh, then you shall bring near with the bull from the herd a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one, hin, one half a hin of oil, and you shall bring near as the drink offering one half a hin of wine as an offering by fire, as a soothing aroma to Yahweh." It's important to note here that the drink offering was given in addition to another offering. It was given in addition to another offering. Why is that so important? Well, for us, I believe to understand, because I really do believe here that Paul is not just drawing on ancient culture. He's drawing on the customs that the Israelite people would have engaged in, what they were instructed to do by the Lord. I think he's drawing on that and he says, he's, even if he's to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of their faith. In other words, Paul recognized that there was a Philippian offering being given in their sacrifices as believers for the furtherance of the gospel. And Paul saw great joy in allowing and having his life be added to the work that the Philippian people were doing. In either sense, whether a, an immediate cultural reference or one from the Old Testament, this is a picture that the Philippians would have understood. The point is that Paul looked on at the work the church was doing, and he rejoiced. He offered himself as a sacrifice in addition to the work and sacrifice the church was already providing. Note this morning, Paul did not view himself any bigger than the people in the Philippian church. He saw himself as a, an offering to be poured out in sacrifice to the Lord. This sacrifice reminds us of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Does anybody remember it? Therefore I exhort you, brothers, 
in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. To offer your bodies, to present your bodies as a sacrifice before the Lord. What does it look like for us to lay ourselves down as sacrifices? I'll tell you this morning, that, that verse is one that the Lord actually used when I was in 8th grade to open my eyes to what it really means to follow Christ. And I'm still learning to this day. But the point here is that Paul recognized that his life was not his own and that he ought to lay himself down upon the work of the church. Paul saw the work that he was doing not separate from the church, but in conjunction with. He had great fellowship with those believers. You know, one statement you ought to be very, very, very wary of if you hear it in the culture today is if someone says, well, I don't go to church, I don't need that. I don't go to church I am the church. That is a total forgetting of what we see time and time again throughout the New Testament. Here when Paul talked, yeah, he was alone, but he saw what he was doing in conjunction with the church at large, the body of Christ serving together in community, in family with one another. Paul took great joy in laying himself down for the sake of the ministry. He took joy in knowing that his life was being used for the purposes of the Lord. And I believe that in this we see a picture of why the disciples went on, you might remember this from Acts, after they were beaten. They better remember what they did. They went on rejoicing. They went on Rejoicing. You recall the many times we see this occur throughout Scripture. Paul, as he looked at the afflictions that he was receiving, he said, I am glad. I am glad. And I rejoice. Yes, I am being poured out. My life is a sacrifice. It is not my own. And man, before the Damascus Road, I'm sure Paul would never have imagined what he was experiencing here in prison, in sacrifice, but alongside of his brothers and sisters in Philippi. Believers are to have their hope, their peace, firmly set on Christ. In Him, they have reason to rejoice regardless of the attacks the world brings their way. It's truly a remarkable reality for us when we live as children of God and recognize that our hope, our peace, our joy, our love is firmly fixed, not in ourselves or our circumstances, but in the finished work of our Savior. And so as Paul looked on at the work the Philippians were doing, it spurred him on to continue in that sacrifice, sacrificing himself before the Lord. Even though Paul was dealing with much, he was likely in pain and agony, dealing with torment. He said, I am glad. You know, that's pretty different from what we hear today. It's different from the way that our hearts often try to stray. But I think his words are much like those that we see as we've been studying in Sunday school of Job. That despite all Paul was facing, he knew the work of the Lord was continuing. And he essentially says here, I am glad or blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be his name. I am glad to be suffering. Because I know that the work my God is doing is incredible. So if I can simply be used for a portion of that work, man, my life, my day, my joy, oh, it's complete. 
happy. I'm so happy. Rejoicing because God's work is continuing. I heard uh, a street evangelist here uh, a number of days ago. I was listening and he shared something that I thought was a, a pretty difficult thing to say. He was on a college campus and and this is this is kind of a countercultural thing for us. And certainly on a college campus, you can imagine, and I was surprised that he wasn't having eggs thrown at him for saying something like this. But it is sharing. He was essentially saying, you know, somebody came up to him with the question of anxiety. And how do we overcome anxiety in our day? And we're gonna actually talk about being anxious as we continue our study in Philippians, but how do we overcome that? Well, I think the point for us is that for Paul, man, he had all day to sit there and be anxious, but instead his heart was filled with gladness. Why? Because he didn't look to himself. He looked to the work that God was doing. When we really consider all that God is doing, we have no reason for anxiety. Because we recognize that even if we are poured out, even as Paul was, he said, even if my life is given up, some people believe, I'm not necessarily in this camp, but some people believe that he was saying, even if I die, even if I die, it's okay. Because God's work continues. So I have reason to be glad. And in verse 18, as, as the Philippian people saw Paul's sacrifice, they too could rejoice in the sustaining work of the Lord as they looked at Paul's life and were encouraged to further sacrifice as they served. Notice he says, likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So I am glad, but you too, be glad. And not just glad in ordinary circumstances. No, glad as you look on at my chains. But you can be glad because you know that these chains are for Christ. That he has me here for a time and place, for a reason and a circumstance. My life is not my own, it's his. And so if this is how he wants to make his news known, then in that I rejoice. In that I rejoice. And so, my point of application for us here this morning, I think there are two things we can draw on from these verses. Two main points for us today as we consider what Paul was sharing with the Philippian people. First of all, there is a great weight put on daily sacrifice. I believe Paul here refers to two driving constants that were to be true of his life and the lives of his fellow believers. When we consider Paul, one thing we know for certain is that the man suffered. The man suffered. But such suffering was not a source of complaining or grumbling. In fact, he just finished telling his fellow believers to knock it off. Don't grumble and dispute. It ends up being such a stench to the testimony we're trying to proclaim here. Understand something this morning. That Paul, as he said that those things should stop, didn't do it from a place of luxury, but he did it in shackles. Stop grumbling and disputing. Well, my life's difficult. My car just went out. All right. But are you in prison being beaten and tortured? Because even if you are, guess what Paul was? And he says, he's glad. He's glad. In all things we have reason to rejoice. Who are we to say to the Lord that he is wrong with the circumstances we found ourselves in? God is never wrong. He's always right. His purpose is his purposes prevail. Blessed be His name. Paul says that his life is one that is to be poured out on the altar of the sacrifice and service of his brothers and sisters in Philippi. He was willing to have himself completely poured out because of his love for the Lord and his love for the church. And when we say we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, we're not talking about a partial ridding. We're talking about a total ridding of our own agendas so that Christ's Agenda may continue. We might thrive as he works and wills for his good pleasure. 
It's a life laid down that Christ might be lifted up. Paul was, in other words, fully devoted to the cause of Christ. All breaths were a moment for praise and service to the Lord. His life was not his own. It was to be used in service, to be used as a drink offering. Consider for a moment this morning how your life might look a little different if instead of waking up in the morning with a list of exciting things you want to accomplish for your own pleasure, you sat there and said, God, what can I do for your pleasure? That my life might offer up a pleasing aroma before you as a sacrifice upon the altar on which your bride gives herself. Might I pour myself out in conjunction with my brothers and sisters who are suffering for your purposes that my life might help to offer up a sweet aroma unto you because it's in you we rejoice, we have our joy, we have our peace. Might our lives look that way. That we would live in such a way that we view ourselves not as a vessel to find pleasure in all of the hedonistic ventures that are out there today. Hedonistic. Might we instead be ones who say, how does God call me to sacrifice today? How does God call me to sacrifice today? The second point, we talked about daily sacrifice, but now there's something neat within that daily sacrifice. I believe we see here from Paul a shared joy. A shared joy. This was something that Paul considered to be a joyous opportunity, this kind of sacrifice. You know, the kind of sacrifice that we might at times find ourselves grumbling about. Paul said, man, this is, this is awesome. Understand how incredible that is. Not only that, but Paul desired for his fellowship with the fellow believers in Philippi to be that of shared joy, sharing together in Christ despite the hardships that they were facing. This reminds us perhaps of what we studied in James chapter 1, verse 2. <coughs> Consider it all joy, my brothers. Consider it all joy when you suffer. It's a blessing for us to be able to share in sufferings for the sake of the Lord. But what an odd thing in terms of what the world views as joy. It's strikingly peculiar. But this joy comes from knowing that we share together in suffering for the glory of God as the body of Christ united. It's much like a Baptist potluck that I mentioned earlier. A Baptist potluck in which we fellowship together, exhorting one another and sharing the common joy we have in knowing that our sacrifices and our sufferings are known by our living God. That when we would come together, we can say, I was struggling this week. I was laying myself down and it was difficult. But praise be to God because when I stand next to Bob and John and Dr. Jim and Kathy, Maybe Michael. <laughs> when I stand alongside of you and I've suffered, I know that you're suffering too. The same cause. That we would share these things much like our potluck following the service. And have a hope and a peace. This is the reason that we come together this morning to sing. Because when we come together, we can share in our sufferings. We can lift one another up and know that no matter what our circumstances are, we have peace, eternal knowledge that Jesus Christ has given us all we need. And He is deserving of our life's commitment. And so today, as we think of our lives, might we not think of ourselves as vessel to be self-interest, but rather vessels that are to be laid 
down, that God might use us, be it through suffering or sacrifice, for His glory. Might we empty ourselves today of our own motives, praying that the Lord would conform us to His desires and help us to take joy, to have peace when we are persecuted for His glory. Heavenly Father, as we consider your word here, this idea of being laid out as a poured out as a drink offering, Lord. Paul certainly dealt with much. He didn't view his life as one that was to be filled with his own agendas and pleasures. No, he sacrificed that to the will of your own. And God, we pray that you would help us to do that now. That we wouldn't be focused on our own self-satisfaction, but that we would instead look at our lives as those things for which we are to lay down and then as we come together, that we might take great joy in knowing that our sufferings can be laid together in this holy potluck. That we share these things together. We hold one another up. We bear with one another. And we press on with that one purpose. We thank you for the hope that peace that rests in our hearts now in Christ Jesus and pray that it would abound in us in these days and moments ahead as we face all the difficulties of this fallen life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to stand with us as we close our time together this morning with a hymn, hymn number 123. O come, O come. Amen.
Lord, we rejoice in you. We thank you. What great hope we have. Oh, that peace that settles our hearts. We thank you for it. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.